Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, my name is Anastasia, and I work for JetBrains. And if you still don't know what we're doing, we're doing tools for developers, uh, namely IDEs. We have a bunch of team tools, but that's not interesting that much uh, for this particular talk. So um, I'm not going to advertise or like show a lot of our tools here. I mostly will be speaking in general about the tools. What I would like to advertise here a little bit is that I'm running uh, a user group, a C++ user group in St. Petersburg in Russia. So if you are by chance in St. Petersburg, which is a wonderful city, please ping me. I will be happy to have you as a speaker, all of you here in that room. So uh, we have quite a big gathering of people, like more than 800 people registered in the group in total. So there's pretty much a big gathering of the C++ people. And yeah, so uh, the talk is called Debug C++ Without Running. Um, maybe that's not a very accurate title. It's more about like debugging while writing the code. And even the debug is not a proper word here. So it's probably more about comprehensing about the, your C++ code while you're just typing your code before you even compile or run a preprocessor. So uh, a bit of agenda for the next uh, like 45 minutes here is I will be showing a couple of C++ examples trying to explain why actually I'm talking here about these kind of things. What's the issue with like comprehensing and understanding your code? And uh, I will try to highlight why I'm talking about this stage where you're not like compiling the code or and what actually the, the, the issue and try to I will then try to show you how the uh, current tooling helps you uh, with the with the problem. That will be partially uh, a dreamer talk. So I will be showing current, uh, currently existing uh, features in various tools, so covering lots of various IDEs. I will be dreaming a little bit, and I'm really hoping for a good dialogue with this audience so that you can dream with me, and we could like maybe create some future requests for all the tool to tooling uh, producers who are here or who will be looking for the recording. So let's start with the trick examples. So. Why I'm talking about the trick examples, like I'm a big fan of C++. I was doing C++ for eight years in production before moving to JetBrains, where I'm not that developing that much, unfortunately. Uh, but I got the feeling that C++ is a very nice language, but very tricky, especially for those who are coming as newbies to the language. And the typical thing that I actually got used to here a lot is, for example, when I'm talking to a game industry, the people out there are like saying, if we want a game quickly, we just take Unity because we like get a bunch of different assets, just throw them all into one bin and we get a game running, we can earn money, that's it. If we need like to get some more uh, complicated game, we have to deal with something like Unreal Engine and oh, that's C++. And you know that feeling when you hear that like, oh, that's C++ from this kind of people, because they're really afraid of language. They're really afraid of what we're doing with language right now because they still are like as our uh, lots of service that we're running and like our um, like friends and other people are running around the communities that lots of people are still on C++ 11 or maybe C++ 14. And you know, we signed up C++ 17. We are like discussing here the features for C++ uh, 12 and uh, like, uh, like 20 and 23 and they're like, Come on, the people are still using 11 and 14, and they're really scared to come to the stage when they start using C++ 17, for example. So maybe the tooling here can help them a little bit so that they are not that scared. And so I'm actually quite happy with the current trend in the C++ community, probably started by many, many people, and I would like to thank personally Herb Sire for highlighting that topic that we could make C++ easier if we think about how the newbies are like coming to the language, how they feel about the language, if the language is toolable at the stage, at the point when we're creating language features, so in the committee. And the Tooling Coalition Group is the perfect place for that, and I'm really happy that it now exists. So I usually start my talks with that quote because I really enjoyed it. and. That's the page where the, uh, Bjorn is actually saying that, yes, he really did say that. And there is a command which is much more important uh, than the quote itself, saying that from his point of view, that's actually the thing that happens to 
every uh, powerful language. So when you like keep protecting yourself from simple dangers with the help of the language, you are occasionally running into harder problems because you don't expect them. And that's what happens with us in C++ quite often. Uh, a couple of months ago, I guess a month ago at ACCU, the, uh, actually some users came to our booth and say that like, but developers should suffer. I replied yes to some extent because like when we do suffer, when we are struggling, we are more attentive, we are like taking taking care of our code. Uh, but should we really? Like could we do something with less efforts, especially in C++? And now let's come to a couple of examples. Uh, so I will try to explain what I'm actually meaning here. So this is a nice example, and there is a story behind the example. Actually, uh, it was created by one of our QA engineers. Uh, she was testing a feature implemented by a developer in the product. And so we have like this kind of automatic testing. We also have a manual testing. The manual testing means that the QA engineer is actually creating some creepy C++ examples and trying to find out if the tool survives. And the tool didn't survive here. Uh, there was some issue, but the, the thing about the example was that when the developer actually came to the point of like fixing an issue, there was like a big question what the example is actually doing, what it means. Because the, it was created like uh, the QA engineer was just playing around the feature and just trying to create some examples that is compilable. And this is a compilable example. But there is there was like a very huge discussion in the team. We were trying to understand what the example is actually doing. What's the sense? What's the meaning behind the example? So yeah, you can see, see that there is some like variable templates happening here, something else. We put it to like, we try to gutball it as we usually do. Uh, nothing helpful actually jumped on us. So then we try to transform the sample a little bit. And we came for this transformation path. So uh, we changed this index uh, for the variable templates a little bit, then we removed the template completely, then we removed the cast, and in the end we find out that that's just a sample that's just returning 42. And that's the whole meaning of that sample. So it's just returning 42. So we, what we can do in more than C++, we can write quite a complicated code that is that in the left corner. and it looks complicated to the person who is not that good at all these things, and it's just doing returns 42. So nothing else, nothing else actually happens here. And that, that's probably the thing that scares the people in C++, so because they can actually do some compilable piece of code with some undefined meaning behind it. There is like a long-standing problem with C++ because we still have macros, we can't af like avoid them. And with macro, you can like do a bunch of creepy stuff with your code, especially if you are not like maybe that fruitful. Uh, like this example is, I, I feel it's a crap, but it's a good representation of what I'm gonna like explain here. And that actually was taken, that's not a real code, but it was done uh, after looking at some real uh, code pieces. So, I had this file xmacro.txt somewhere that has some code. It's not even a C++, it's just a text. And I have this uh, macro definition, which is x, which is doing something with this piece of text. And then the enum is generated for me. And then I'm like using the values of this enum in my function foo. And if you look accurately at this example, you can like find out that there are a couple of problems here. First of all, like who knows where this x macro txt is and what is actually there? No one, because we can see it right here. When we undefine the x macro, we lose all the information about what it, it was actually doing. So we don't have any traces of what was actually happening right after the moment we undefined the x macro. And like, yeah, and the obvious problem is that we don't, ha we don't know the actual enum values. So we start like writing the switch case operator and we're happy if we have a tooling that can generate something for us or we could like uh, pay attention to some warning that some case, case uh, is actually missing. But still we're at the point when we are writing something and we don't know actually what we're using. So we don't see the, the proper result there. And yeah. Another thing about the macro is like we can do some 
bunch of query definitions with macros. So here I have a class definition. And actually, that's quite complicated to figure out that I have here a class, class A, class B, and class C. And they have this kind of a function called A, called B, and KC, each one inside. But to get this, I have to read all this macro definition. And they could be very complicated. They could be not just two macros. They could be a bunch of macros included one into each other. So all these tax substitutions are complicated because you don't know what is the result until the very end. And you're happy if they're in the same file, but they are probably not. They are somewhere else, and you have to find them, and all that story. Another example here is, uh, I really love this example because it shows me how we deal with the C++ because you need to know the value of the magic to get the like critical difference in the right part of the code. Because if you like pay attention to the foo.cpp, you have a last line in, in this test function which is saying outer k and then this x blah blah blah. And this is either an expression or a template. And it depends on this magic. And like you have to know this magic to understand if X is a type or not. And like before you know the magic, you can get the type information. And before you get the type information, you can't actually understand what's written in your code there on the right. And we can go further. This is a nice example from Herb Sutter's proposal on meta classes. And you know what? I like the proposal really much. I'm like in the fan camp for meta classes, but what are we going to get? We're going to get like the developer is writing the code on the right top corner. And this developer actually gets the code on the top, well, like bottom right corner. So and some magic happens like somewhere in between. And we actually don't know what we're going to have in the end if we don't write, uh, read the meta class itself, if we don't like do some compilation. So if we're just typing the code, we type this interface shape, and we don't know actually what is going to be inside if we don't know what the meta class is actually doing. <coughs> so yeah, and as Herb actually called these, these concepts of meta classes and all these things, these are some kind of hiders who are hiding the final code from us while we're writing it. Another good example of like hiding the code is overloading operators. Because what's the issue with the overloaded operator? When you're looking at the operator usage in your code, you never know if it's some kind of a default behavior or that's some kind of an overloaded behavior. You never know when you see a plus if it's really a plus or it's doing a minus under, underneath. We never do these creepy things. We try to be like consistent, that's true. But like, who knows what this particular plus operator is doing for me? And in the example here, if you take a look at the last line, so half of the operators are overloaded and half are just regular operators, default ones. And if I just look at this code, I have no idea that this is happening because they look the same to me in my code until some tool is trying to help me to distinguish them. Um, yeah, Tony? They're all overloaded. <laughs> Yeah, Tony's command was that they are all overloaded. Some you're just more familiar with. Yeah, that's true. Like some of us are just like we, we are more familiar with some of them and maybe not familiar with some other of them. And yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, talking about function overloads, um, this is some kind of for example that we were, we were using for testing for like overload uh, testing in in our tooling, and like. If you have a compiler in your head, and you can just guess that the answer will be, like the, the output of the main function will be uh, two and two. But like, if you're not a Richard Smith with a compiler in your head, and you're not that smart, and you, you actually have to find out what's the output, you actually have to find what's the overload. The overload rules are not that complicated, so like, don't get me wrong. So that's just a simple algorithm that is described in the standard. But if you have to do them in your head, that's complicated. And there are a bunch of other stuff that could like confuse you while you're writing the code, all these const expert things, all these like reflection and other, other things that we are probably going to uh, have or already have. 
So uh, talking about uh, why I need this kind of information while I'm typing the code is because if I try to fix some issue in my code, I have a two like two general ways of doing that. So I can either like you know read my code, fix something, run and check like tests or just a simple application running, whatever. I can like I can like read, fix, or maybe print something, or I can debug something step by step. And that's just a constant loop that is happening. But the problem is that the compilation could take actually quite a long time. It might not be possible on the platform I'm currently writing my code, so it might be compiled somewhere else, and I might not have like a constant access to that platform. It might require some deployment step, which could be quite long. It could require like time and resources. And so the code base could be actually incomplete, so I might be developing some library, so I have to implement some actual usage of the library to actually run some tests and do something. And there may be not even a bug, so there might be just some flow in logic, or I'm just trying to get some understanding of the code. So, and I like I can get some understanding of the code just constantly running it on various tests, but that's not the thing that we want to do. And that's just exactly about these kind of a transparency that we need, so that we would like to look at the code and understand it and all the tools that are like happening on the runtime, all this compilation, all these debugging tools, they're not helpful. And the static analysis tools that we have, they're kind of helpful, but they just catch in some like warnings or errors. They're not that very helpful for the actual understanding of the code behind the letters we have on the screen. And I would like to say like some kudos to Herb Sarder because actually this talk it appeared after his CPVCon presentation where he was talking about abstraction hiders and that these kind of abstractions we now have in the language, they need some tooling, otherwise they're completely uh, not understandable by the developers. And I'm gonna like thank him personally for this nice quote that good abstractions do need to be toolable because that's crucial, otherwise in the tooling we can't support them properly. And Herb actually had this kind of a nice feature set for us. So I really treat this slide from CPP, his CPPCon as a set of feature requests. So these are nice. So um, I will be talking about more things here. But like, if you're interested in uh, these cases, just do go to YouTube and check this, uh, the Herb's keynotes from the CPPCon. So yeah, now tooling. So let's see what we have in the tools. Um, let's first start from this kind of a macro debugging. So how we could actually understand what is hidden there behind the macro. So there is a bunch of solutions currently existing in the tools. Some of them are just existing for a quite long time. Some of them are just quite new. So and there, here I have like three, three examples what we can do. So the first one is, uh, so our goal is actually to understand the per processor output without actually running it. That's what we're trying to do here. And the first thing is just ask our tooling for a final replacement. And that's what like a couple of tools now can do. So this is a screenshot from our C line. Microsoft just announced the same feature at Amazon build just yesterday for Visual Studio upcoming. So yeah, and what it does is actually very simple. It just shows you the final replacement. So in a one quick look, you just can get what is hidden behind this macro and just understand what's there. Yeah. Sorry, so this has multiple levels of uh, definitions uh, included, uh, the magic and everything. Uh, does that, would it actually uh, show me all the definitions or just the direct one? Yeah, so the question was if it's showing the, all the definitions or just the direct one. So how the final replacement usually working? It just shows you the final replacement, like substituting all the macroses. So there will be another kind of feature, which I will show later, which is doing it step by step. So what is the benefit here? So here, that's just a view. So we don't need to, to modify your code in any way. So just requesting a tool to show you some view, and in this view you get this kind of a final replacement. So just a quick shot on what's happening inside. Um, yeah, so there is another thing, uh, another way to do that, when you can actually debug your macro. So just substitute it step by step, 
And that's kind of helpful because it unwinds these, less it's called macro stack backwards, and you just keep unwinding it. You can stop at any point, so probably you don't need to unwind it to the very end. Probably like there are some like boost macros in the very end that you don't need to uh, substitute. You just need to know that they are there at that point. So unwinding the stack in that way, you just get into the point where you say like, okay, I'm done with that, I'm fine, I now understand what's there behind. So, but yeah, that actually changes your code, so it unwinds you, but then you can do just undo in your tool and go back to the previous version. Um, there is a small thing that you have to keep in mind about the context, but I will come to it a couple of slides later. So, substitute all steps, uh, yeah, so by the way, this is what we've done in ReSharper C++ in extension for Visual Studio. I'm not sure anyone else is doing that, but uh, yeah, so. The guys actually also implemented the substitute all steps. It's quite similar to just getting the final replacement, but it just gets, gets it for you in code and not in a separate view. And some kind of a real world example for doing that. So for example, let's assume we have this uh, code on the right, right top corner, and there is some uh, boost PP macro, which I would like to understand. <laughs> so what I can do, I can just go step by step. And in the end, after a couple of steps, I will go to this code in the bottom, where I can just get there doing the final replacement. And so I will get this kind of a sequence, uh, getting what I'm gonna get in the end after the substitution of the macro. I said that you have to be careful about the context. And let's assume we have this kind of example, which is actually using the counter macro. And the same story can happen to you if you use like land macro or others like that. And the thing is that if you substitute the next usage of the new var, you get something like that and you see the tooling is actually highlighting me with the red squiggles, the third line, and the story is that I actually changed the semantic of this code right now because after substitution on the second usage of the new var, which is on the third line, I have now the var one, so v1 happening there. So I have the duplicate declaration right now. And this is the thing you have to be careful with if you're really changing your code, substituting your macros because they could be context dependent like this counter or line macro. And you're lucky if this is happening like in the subsequent lines, but if that's not, you might, might run into issues. So this is kind of a powerful, but still a couple of dangerous features, so you just need to be careful with it. Um, another example about macro debugging is a very popular case which we are quite often requested is to show some intelligence inside macro definitions. And what people usually are asking us is like, could you show me some navigation? So if you go to the definition of uh, func and macro, so could I just go through this func? Could I go somewhere from, 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 this, uh, from this line? So, and what the, most of the tools are actually doing, they're suggesting you two locations where to navigate to. And you might notice that they all are missing the third one, which actually exists here as well. Because they suggest you to go to the func definition like with uh, int and double, which are the first and the second line of this code example. But there is also this kind of call for a func m macro in the very end, and there is this integer also called func, and so you kind of have to take it into account. So, I, like the idea of this example is that we could implement a lot of interesting features inside the macro, but sometimes they're very tricky because we, we might run into these issues. So, and a lot of features that are running and working around the macro usages, they quite often actually fails in some situations like that, if you're doing some like tricky things, because that's not that obvious. Okay, let's move from macro to some more interesting stuff. So like, let's try to find out uh, if we could debug the type information in some way. And so about the type. So we got used for many years of C++ usage that we always know the type, but that's not true anymore. And we can run into the example like that when we don't have the type information at all, but you can easily get that this op 
variable has actually type double. And if I use the do operation call from just free, free, uh, zero, then I get the int. And so it would be nice if the tooling could help us with that. And the tooling actually can because the tooling usually has the full AST build, so it can just guess the type easily. And all the tools that I know, like all the big players on the C++ tooling market actually can do that. So these are screenshots from like Visual Studio, Eclipse, C-Line. So we all know how to infer the type. We can show it to you. So you just call some action. It's just different from one tool to another. You just call some action and get the infer type in some kind of a window or view. And that's very useful. Um, yeah, so Another thing is that let's try to do something similar to what we've done with the macro trying to debug it step by step. Can I debug my type step by step? And the answer is yes, you can. So uh, here is the example when I try to actually understand what is the type of high at the last line of my code example. And maybe I'm not that good with boost MPL. Maybe I don't know how it works. Maybe I don't know what the actual type I'm going to get there. And it would be nice if I could debug it the same way as I debug my cursor, so just substituting these type devs step by step and getting these final results on the right that is saying this, yeah, like, yeah, the highs of type D. And so, like, again, it requires you to change the code because that's like what Resharper C is doing, and they're just substituting it in your code, so you just call the action that substitutes the type. And the idea is very similar to uh, what is done with the macro substitution. Um, let's come to more interesting uh, meta information debugging. So, and here we have some kind of real abstractions. And here we have templates, here we have const experts, and all the stuff. And it would be interesting to know, like, when you see a line of the code, how the template was actually instantiated. So what was the template, what was the argument, what was actually selected. And the tooling can do that. So um, it, like these are the screenshots like from um, Eclipse and this one is the CVELOP. Uh, yeah, so what the tooling can actually do there, it can show you, like yeah, in the Visual Studio on the bottom, so it can show you what, what was the initial uh, template and what the guys in Cvelop do. That's why I actually put this screenshot here. It's a very interesting thing. They have a separate window which you can uh, like call with some action and you get uh, these nice lines here explaining you how the arguments were selected. So and you can get some understanding why this template was and how it was actually used. And I don't have a lot of uh, like place on this slide, but they actually could um, show you not just a single window, but they can build you some kind of a hierarchy of the several windows connected, showing you how these templates were instantiated one by one, so you can get the understanding uh, or the whole trace. Um, what I would like to actually have here, and this is kind of a dream slide here, uh, is I would like to to have some kind of a combination of two great features here. So I would like to, so you can see a template here. And so I have this function get value and I call it twice. And what I want to do is I really would like to navigate from this get value to the like template and see the code that is actually called for me based on this actual usage. And would be perfect if I could also get some kind of highlighting for the const expert, just highlighting the unnecessary part in gray and all that stuff. That's a dreamer slide, so I'm just dreaming because I really would like to have that, uh, but I haven't seen it. But like I've seen a couple of features that are looking very similar. First of all, um, I can't say that I've really seen it. I've read, ab I've read about it many times that the kdevelop actually can do this kind of things. When you navigate from the template usage to the template, it could show you some intelligence based on the usage. But I failed to reproduce it in the latest version. Not sure what's going on there. Maybe they've broken it. But the Visual Studio right yesterday announced this. I will try to run the video. Uh, yeah, so what they are doing here is that's what they showed yesterday on build, actually. So there is a template, and so they will be adding in some like special UI. They are actually adding what they are gonna 
used for instantiation of this template, and based on this information, the IntelliSense starts working. So you'll see now the completion that will, that will work. So yeah, they're typing begin, and now they get the completion. So that's really quite a powerful feature. I would maybe dream further. So I would like a feature that will automatically collect all the usages and suggest me the IntelliSense automatically at this point. So without actually uh, calling me proactively to substitute the type to provide it somehow to the feature. But yeah, that, that's actually really cool. Um, now let's think talk a little bit about the overloads debug. So, and here I will talk about operators and functions. And like talking about the operators, like there is some nice features happening currently in the tool when the tooling can highlight you. Um, I'm not sure if, yeah, the screen doesn't allow you to show, but the cursor is on that operator and actually highlights me my overload there. So when you just put a cursor, you can see that, that that's that actual operator. And that's the C line who actually can also do the find usages for the operator. So if you just put a cursor on the operator, you can call the find usages and it will get uh, like where this particular operator is used so to get some kind of understanding. So yeah, and you get some you can get actually some understanding if that's like your operator overload or something else. Um, talking about the function overloads, so as I said, the algorithm is pretty much straightforward. So how the tool could help you with understanding what the actual overload is doing there. So currently the tooling is mostly helping you with the first steps. So they're just trying to show you the whole range of possible options you might get for this overload. So uh, for example, this is um, like here at the bottom, that's the Visual Studio. And there, that's the C line screenshot. So we're just showing you some kind of a parameter info information. Um, like Visual Studio may be doing that in a not very convenient way, just forcing you to like scroll through the parameter info sets one by one. Uh, like other toolings, um, like Eclipse uh, and like C line, Resharper C, just shows you the whole bunch of sets. Uh, the guys from Resharper C++, they also added this nice thing that you not only get the function signature, like, but you also get the documentation. So if you have your Doxygen command or something before the function, you can also look at it there. And that, that all is there to help you to understand why this particular function overload was selected. So what were the options for the arguments? What, what are you actually using and why this overload happened? So would be good to show also the full candidate set with some explanations, but that's like that's again the dreamer slide. I don't know the tooling that is actually doing that, trying to explain you like to sort the candidates in some like proper order and trying to understand so trying to explain to you why this actual candidate was selected. The only thing that like I know about this is that that's not a real feature that I'm gonna like run here. I'll try to run the video, yeah. So that's just a prototype that we, we did in there, our spare time in the team when we were playing around and we called it navigate to similar functions. And that's like kind of interesting in terms of the overload because if you have the function signature mismatched to what you have here, the tool still can try to find you some similar <laughs> function signature to help you to, to understand what's going on there, maybe to fix some things. Uh, like this is kind of doable, so that's just a prototype, but that just says that, yeah, you can do that. Okay, enough for the overloads. Um, let's talk a little bit about the includes, because like until the time we get some model and get rid of all the includes code, I think I won't be speaking here anymore. So uh, I will be like retired somewhere. <laughs> so we still deal with lots of includes and we still have to deal with them properly. And I once found this very nice article, which is like quite old. So it's like seven years old already, but still it explains a very obvious thing. Like when you start a project, it's like quite small, then you add more and more functionality. And in the end, 
you just get a bunch of different includes in your projects and this kind of a blow up factor just increases a lot because like if you just divide uh, the total like the blow up factor so when you just divide the total lines uh, from UK to the total lines parsed and the total lines parsed means that you substitute all the header files and just uh, see this factor and it could be quite unpleasant actually so you could parse your like in, on average for example on a kind of a big project you could parse one line of code like 50 times on average just because of this blow up factor and that's not very like pleasant, it increased the compile time, it just increased the complexity of the whole understanding of what's going on in the tool. There is an obvious solution to that, we all know that, that's a precompiled headers. But like to push a project to use precompiled headers is probably not a very like easy thing because there could be some legacy in the code, there could be lots of things happening, they could be even not possible at all. So we'd better have some tooling and we actually have some tools in stock. So. The first thing, as we call it, is includes profiler. That's what the guys from Rushaper C++ implemented. When you can actually request the uh, information about your project in terms of like how many lines you have and how many inclusive lines you have in each file, which actually calculates all the lines after the whole substitution. And what you can do here, you can just sort by this kind of uh, like line contribution inclusive column and just try to find out if that any, makes any sense to you or not. And there are of course a bunch of tools who tries to optimize this kind of thing for you. So there are like tools that just shows you the unused includes and you can then just go and remove them or like somehow try to optimize them. There is this uh, fantastic include what you use, which Google proclaims that that help, they help them a lot, like to improve the compile speed for to 40%, like by 40%. So that's nice. So, uh, and there is also this uh, include editor, which is, uh, I guess there is a plugin for Eclipse ADT for it. They both do kind of a similar job. So they try to, both tools try to mark you the unused includes and they try to uh, replace includes with forward declarations with sometimes helpful I know that some people don't like this kind of a technique, but still it's helpful in terms of like reducing the number of includes and trying to deal somehow with the compilation speed and to reduce some kind of physical dependencies for your files. So yeah, and that's actually mostly it. So just a couple of short links here to that blog post about the header hero and the talk from Herb Sarter, which actually inspired me for the talk. And we still have six minutes for the questions. Yeah. Uh, do you think modules will be a big game changer? I mean, everything you just said about includes. So the question was about modules, if they are going to be some kind of a game changing. So in terms of the help to the tooling to deal easier with the code, they will definitely do. Uh, I'm pretty much sure we could come up with some interesting features for the modules, but first we have to accept them to the standard in any kind of acceptable way which satisfies everyone. <laughs> yeah? So I've been listening to your talk and I'm sitting here and thinking to myself, this is great, I'd love to use some of this stuff. My ID is Emacs, can you help with that? The question was that like, uh, there is some inspiration from the talk and uh, like really, the people would like to use some of these tools, but sometimes it's just Emacs, which is actually not a bad tool. It can do a lot of great stuff. There are a lot of plugins for Emacs that's some kind of an ecosystem that which evolves. But I still do believe that Veeam, which I'm a big fan of, I'm in a Veeam camp, sorry, and Emacs are still a text editor. So they are not. Th these are not the tools for providing this kind of intelligent stuff. I'm still a fan of Veeam because I still think that for a small task when you just need to fix a couple of lines of your code, when you just know that there is this simple file which you understand quite good and just need to fix something in it, you just open it quickly in Veeam and you're done. So you don't need to start the whole ID stuff like because there could be some like time delays for indexing, whatever. So, but if you're like Re ready to wait for that, ready to like to deal with some drawbacks, then the IDE could do a lot of things for you. So, and the IDEs on the market are currently really strong. So I, I, I would like to say that like all the tooling that we have in stock for like real C++ IDEs are quite strong. So they are still struggling a lot of, a lot with the language itself because like it's C++, which is not that obvious. 
there are a lot of help from the clan community and so there is like a bunch of interesting work happening around all these things and probably will have some bright future quite soon but like if you really need the smart help from your tool you need to move to a smart tool that's it okay more questions okay then thank you